It begins with a spark. Hey, Jackie, wait for me. The passion for air and space. Why don't you take it? You look better on you anyway. Hey Jack, you remember her? That passion can grow. Lighting the way forward for a lifetime. And now, with the monumental transformation of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, this place that has ignited generations of imaginations will be completely reimagined, inside and out. Also, this museum can be even more of what it's always been. A place that gives life to a remarkable past and gives rise to the people who will make history tomorrow. Join us in the mission to transform the National Air and Space Museum. Together, we'll ignite tomorrow. Good evening, my name is Chris Brown and I serve as the acting director of the National Air and Space Museum. And welcome to tonight's celebration, started by Vice Admiral Donald DeAngan years ago, titled Flight Jacket Night, in celebration and recognition of our National Air and Space Society members. It's a tradition that started because of the significance of flight jackets to many aviators. My story started back in Pensacola about 40 years ago when I was given this jacket upon uh, receiving my wings, uh, finishing flight school. And like all young ensigns and newly minted aviators, I sewed patches on to somehow celebrate my accomplishments. I was, after all, Sierra Hotel. I'll let you figure out what that means. And not to be outdone, when I went on break, I wore my jacket with its patches to the Cheers bar. Yes, the bar made famous by that television series, Cheers. And I went with some friends, none of whom happened to have been in the military. So I was a little bit on my own. But what really happened and set the rest of the evening in motion was when the barkeep came to me and before serving, looked at me up and down and said, what are you, some kind of Shriner? I was devastated. And with no disrespect to the Shriners of America who do great charitable work at hospitals all across the country, I was wearing the jacket that I'd been given for receiving my wings, my naval aviation wings. And somehow to be confused with anything else really upset me. Well, I went back to Pensacola to continue with training. And upon arrival, the base CO had said, no more flight jackets off base, especially ones with patches. We don't want you in, to be seen in civilian attire with that jacket on. So not to be undone, I took the patches off because I was going to wear this jacket, yes, with civilian clothes off base, incognito, so to speak, that I would know the significance of the jacket. But not to be outdone, I did have another jacket. 
a jacket with the patches that tell the story, the story of aviation and what I went on to do with the Navy, very similar to the flight jacket being worn by the model behind me representing Donald DeAngan and the flight jacket he wore and the stories that it told and tells. And that's why this night is so important because flight jackets are jackets, right? But they tell a story. And we're in the business of telling stories. And flight jackets help us do that. So we can't tell stories, though, without the support of our National Air and Space Society members. The support you give is so important, and especially now as we go through transformation. Tonight, we're celebrating the accomplishments of Apollo 15. And who better than to share those experiences and accomplishments than Dr. Farouk Elbaz and Dr. James Head. They'll engage in a conversation moderated by the former director of the museum and now Undersecretary for Science and Research, Dr. Ellen Stofan. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague from the Space History Department, Dr. Tizel Muir Harmony, who will introduce our panel. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks, Chris. I'm Dr. Tizel Muir Harmony, the curator of the Apollo Collection at the Smithsonian. In the late 1960s, Bellcom posted job advertisements that caught the eye of two young geologists. The ads featured images of the earth and moon and provocative taglines like, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. And the shortest distance between two points is often imagination. Bell Labs established Bellcom in the early 1960s to provide high level technical advice to NASA headquarters. Now the organization needed forward thinking geologists to select lunar landing sites, train astronauts, and extend the field of planetary geology. Tonight, we honor these two geologists who answered Bellcom's call for imaginative thinkers, Dr. Farouk El Baz and Dr. James Head. Their work on the Apollo program was pivotal to our current understanding of the origin and evolution of the moon and our solar system. Dr. El Baz developed a love of science and the natural world as a child growing up in Egypt. After receiving a bachelor's of science degree in 1958, he earned a master's and a PhD in geology. Dr. Head similarly had an interest in science as a child. As a teenager in the Washington DC area, Dr. Head tuned his shortwave radio to pick up the beeping from the first satellite Sputnik in 1957. He went on to earn degrees in geology, including a PhD in 1969. Elbaz started working on the Apollo program in 1967, becoming the secretary of the landing site selection committee. Head joined the team a year later in 1968. Together, they helped select landing sites for all six Apollo landing missions. Elbaz taught astronauts how to make useful visual observations from lunar orbit and how to locate features of interest on the moon. Head trained the astronauts, helped select experiments and analyzed return lunar samples. After the final Apollo mission in 1972, Dr. Elbaz established the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies at the National Air and Space Museum, while Dr. Head became a professor at Brown University. Throughout their careers, Dr. Elbaz and Dr. Head have made an immeasurable impact on the field of planetary geology through their research, mentorship, and scientific collaboration. On the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15, the ninth crewed mission in the Apollo program and the fourth lunar landing mission, it is fitting that we return our attention to lunar geology. The mission marked the Apollo program's transition to deeper and more extensive scientific exploration. Moderating tonight's conversation with Dr. Elbaz and Dr. Head is Dr. Ellen Stofan, Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ellen Stofan, as you've heard, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. And obviously, a huge welcome to our National Air and Space Society members. You know, they may have uh, kicked me up the road to the the castle, um, but air and space um, remains extraordinarily close to my heart. And I'm so thrilled to be here tonight to moderate this conversation. Um, in no small measure, because my first job ever was working as an intern at the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies for none other than Dr. Farouk Elbaz, uh, and Dr. James Head was my PhD advisor. So I have a very close um, relationship with these two men who I absolutely adore, and I'm so honored um, to be moderating uh, this conversation tonight. 
And we're also really excited um, because the National Air and Space Museum on the mall, you know, hazi has been open now since June. Uh, the mall building is actually opening on uh, July 30th. So we're finally getting open again. We're very excited about that. And I really wanna welcome our two speakers as we celebrate this incredible observation uh, uh, incredible um, uh, anniversary, there we go, of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15. Um, I, you know, I wanted to start with this this topic that, that Teasel had been covering, the fact that both of you worked for Belcom. And Farouk, can you tell us a little bit more about the relationship um, between NASA and the contractors like Belcom during the Apollo missions? Uh, NASA regularly had uh, uh, contractors, and the contractors worked for NASA headquarters, and they did the job, and they paid NASA paid for for their work and for the time and for a little bit for a profit, some some profit or another. Belcom was a completely different idea. It was not some somebody that applied to work for for NASA at all. It was really a uh, an incredible thing from of uh, Jim Webb. Jim Webb was the first uh, uh, director of NASA. He had this vision, he said, imagination. He said the most difficult problems that we're going to encounter is communications with anybody that's going to go into Earth orbit or on the way to the moon or around the moon or on the moon. But how, how do we communicate with these people? Because communication at the time was a telephone that you hold in your head like this, and it is connected by wire, wire to the other person that you're talking to. In, in the space business, there is no such thing. There will be no lines. So what is it that we can do communication-wise? So Jim Webb wrote a letter to the chairman of AT&T telling him that mo this is a problem that only people that have a great uh, vision and imagination about communications can help. So we would like you to have people from your operation, which is Bell Laboratories, in, in which is where it was very famous uh, place in, in technology of the day. It's, it's, it was like Bell, Lab, Bell Labs was both the uh, Apple and, Cosmo, and Microsoft and uh, 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 Amazon and all these people thinking put, put together. Mm -hmm. So they had told them that we'd like to have some of these people again to NASA headquarters and work with NASA headquarters to solve these communication problems. But this is a national objective. So we're going to give you the, the money for the, of your cost plus $1 a year for the Jim Webb. And Jim and the man, the chairman of AT&T, went to or collected the board and sat down. And they said, well, this is something that we're going to do for the United States of America. Ta, 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 ta. And they did that. So, the, so, so Jim Webb basically got to NASA headquarters, people to work at cost. That's amazing. I have yes. never heard that story. That's yes. absolutely stunning. Yeah. So Jim, on your very first day working at Belcom, um, you received an awfully big assignment for day one. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I got there uh, just before Apollo 7. It was uh, like Farouk attracted by those great ads, uh, like a full moon picture and it said, Simply, our job is to think our way to the moon and back. And there was a phone number. So I called and a couple of interviews, and then I got the job. So it was like a totally amazing because we all wanted to go to the moon. So when I got there on my first day, um, you know, the boss said to me, you know, we usually give uh, new people a month to um, actually, you know, read up on things. But, you know, we're launching we're launching uh, in, uh, Apollo 7 in, in a week and a half here. So um, it, take this assignment, which is, summarize the next six human landing site candidates for the moon uh, for congressional testimony in two days to give to the uh, head of the Apollo program who's going to testify before Congress. And it was like, I didn't know anything about the moon. Nobody did, which was my savior. So I had to learn very, very fast. It's like the Berlitz total immersion. You know, I was thrown into the deep end of the pool. And that's how you learn, because nobody knew what they were doing. And we're launching on Tuesday. So you did the best you could. You did absolutely the best you could. And uh, like Indiana Jones, you know, we're making it up as we go along. And that's what we were doing. And it was absolutely fantastic. So I learned so much. And that was a great introduction, probably better than taking a month to read. Amazing. I, I can't imagine that kind of responsibility. I would have freaked out. So <laughs> congratulations that you just carried on. It was what you had to do. 
Um, Farouk, um, talk about the first scientific expedition to the moon. Um, you know, why was, why was this mission different? The first scientific, uh, meaning Apollo 15, you mean, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, only because of the fact that we had to make vast changes to the spacecraft and expand the time that the astronauts will, will use and both for in, in orbit and on the surface. And because of doing that, we're gonna have ad additional material, additional equipment and, and we'll take a Jeep with us and we then we'll put in this in the orbital craft all kinds of instruments to measure the chemistry of the lunar surface all around the moon and so on. So the, it's vast changes that happened, uh, that occurred for Apollo, for the first scientific mission to the moon, Apollo 15, because of the, ex, the extending the time, as well as making absolutely certain that we will have so many, so much more to do on the moon and in, in lunar orbit. And Farouk, how, how then did you train the, because obviously you are all were training the astronauts. So how was the astronaut training different than for Apollo 15 than from earlier missions? Of course, from earlier missions, we learned a lot more. And there were all kinds of confusing things from the, uh, the observations of the moon. And uh, from Apollo 10, we had all kinds of things about the, the colors on the lunar surface. And there are uh, basalts of chocolate brown color and there are places of set that, uh, and then Apollo 11, uh, Apollo 11, yeah, this or Apollo 10, and uh, sometimes of Apollo 8, actually, Apollo 8 came and said that there is absolutely no color. It all looks like plaster of Paris and so on. So there were conflicting statements from the astronauts who, because we thought that they say that because they are not really trained. They are not, they do not know what they're looking at. They don't know what, what the far side of the moon would look like and what the near side looks like. And what is the difference in the material of the light colored material on the moon, which is the terra and the, the, those, the dark areas, which are the Maria. So they, we need to teach them these kinds of things one by one, step by step, so that the cumulative, they, they learn a little more. So we started with 11 and did some with 12 and then uh, a bit with 13 and 14. And then by the time we came to 15, we, we knew exactly what to do. So that's why the, th the last three missions brought us a, a great deal more, only because we ourselves, the geologists that were supporting, knew exactly what to do. That's amazing. Jim, um, how did geologists come to work on the Apollo missions and in particular Apollo 15? So how did how did you find people to work? Was it just the folks at Belcom or did you bring more people in at that point? Yeah, there was a very large group of people involved. It was, you know, like everything in Apollo, it was a group effort. I mean, we had incredible people engaged. So we had people from Johnson Space Center, of course, you know, the all the scientists there. We had people, a major part was the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, Gene Shoemaker, uh, Gordon Swan, Bill Mulberger were principal investigators actually on a geological uh, experiment, it was called. And that was training the astronauts, developing the tools, developing the techniques, leading field trips, et cetera. So I, I, I remember, you know, early on, these were all test pilots, okay? So I remember uh, Dale Jackson telling me the story of, it, with the Gemini and Mercury astronauts of going to Ellington Air Force Base just north of JSC and having a class in geology First thing he said was, okay, everybody who has a degree in geology, raise your hand. Um, nobody raised their hand. Everybody who's taken a geology course, raise your hand. Nobody raised their hand. Everybody who has an interest in geology or did it as a hobby, collected rocks, nobody raised their hands. So he goes, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do here? So that was the beginning. And, and you know, from that point, everybody marshaled an effort knowing that the, as Farouk was pointing out, capabilities and, and understanding were going to increase. And so training occurred in the lab with the return samples, training occurred in the field. We took the astronauts all over the world. Training occurred in classrooms and so on. Um, and it became very, very sophisticated by the time Apollo 15 uh, came around. And indeed that was the first scientific expedition to the moon. And Dave Scott was instrumental in that. The astronauts were won over. You know, I remember just going up in the elevator and in, uh, in building, uh, in building, building one in Houston uh, headquarters building, but the, uh, maybe half a dozen astronauts, and and they said, "Hey, geologist Jim, how's it going?" And I said, "You know, you guys um, on these advanced missions, um, once you get out of the lunar module, you plant the flag and you take the call from the president, you're going to have six hours and fifty minutes left, and if you don't learn some geolingo, 
uh, there's going to be a lot of dead air time. And they go, whoa, good point. So, you know, a little competitiveness helped to, to win them over too. So that was a lot of fun. I, I was going to ask, you know, the, the reaction. I, I suppose it's like any class you still have um, in introductory geology. Some of the students are terribly enthusiastic and other ones are maybe sleeping in the back of the class. I'm not well, asking you to tell tales out of school, but I'm curious about the reaction. Well, I, I think in general, you know, there was I've, I've worked in astronaut training with all the new classes ever since. OK, up till up till today. And and, you know, in the middle of the you remember the posters, the space shuttle going to work in space. Well, you know, it's not a lot about geology. So there was a little a few little in those classes, a few little uh, coffee cup rumblings, you know, bangings, et cetera. Like, uh, you know, we need a break here, so on and so on. But in general, they were really enthusiastic. And and, and the Russians, too, who trained, they were absolutely great as well. So, um, you know, Dave Scott was really instrumental in restructuring the training schedule. He took a look with the training schedule. And he said, toilet training. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. We need more geology. And he uh, he and, um, uh, you know, uh, Jim Irwin and, and, of course, you know, Al Warden. I mean, they were really excited. And so it was very easy after that. But Dave was instrumental. Uh, in that as well. So that's that's incredible. So the crews and then Jack Schmidt, the geologist astronaut, uh, was helping all the way along, bringing on Lee Silver and other really good people to train. Now, I understood you asked the astronauts to look for rocks with holes in them. I, I know why, but maybe you can uh, explain that. I Because well, you trained me, so I know why. But uh. That's that's true. I probably, have, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, um, I have tons of rocks here, but you don't want to see them. So, so when molten rock comes out of the ground, it's decreasing in pressure because it's getting close to the surface. Any gas in the magma starts to come out, like in soda water when you open it up. So what that does is create gas bubbles, and then they freeze in the rock when it cools. So we didn't. The moon seemed to be without any water, okay, from the analysis of the samples. Yet that seemed wrong, and there must be other gases in there. And so, you know, we told all the astronauts, and Dave in particular, if you see a rock with holes in it. Uh, definitely pick it up because that's going to tell us something about um, the uh, gas bubbles and the gas. And as you can see in the lower right there, uh, on the way back from EBA3, uh, Dave Scott was being encouraged by mission control. You're running on, you know, oxygen levels low, get back to the lunar module. He says, roger that, roger that. And he said, Houston, I have a problem with my seatbelt. I got to stop and fix it. Oh yeah, fix it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and he gets off, collects this sample because that's why he stopped. And then, uh, indeed, gets back on the rover and says, Houston, um, seatbelt's okay, good to go. Okay, get back to the lunar module. Dave calls that not disobeying mission control. He calls it commander's prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> now, Farouk, you can see something in this slide here, that, that lunar, um, the lunar car, the lunar rover that the astronauts use. Why was that mo mobility so important? Um, and, and how did it get well demonstrated on this mission? Oh, it was very important because of the fact that uh, even that in that specific mission, we had a very high mountain, Montes Apenninus, and then a very low area, which was a, 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 a drill, which is kind of like a dry river. And so these were vastly different and vastly away from each other, meaning that you nearly need to get from one place to get to go see uh, that 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 depth of the terrain to the mountain range, meaning that you have to go several places at different times and sometimes drive a vehicle for hours to get to the, to the site or another. So the mobility on that place was really very important to get to, to, the, uh, to the Apennine Mountains and the Hadley Rill, which is a depression. So you have a mountain range and the depression, you get to them back and forth. Uh, you need that mobility, no question about it. And, and tied into that, I guess, can you talk about the length of the mission and, and why it was important that this mission be longer? As the, the length of the mission was very important on the surface, it was damned important from above, from orbit, because we had all kinds of instruments, like X-rays, monitoring, and then gamma ray with X-ray, with gamma ray together, and then a huge mapping camera and a huge the uh, uh, panoramic camera, the panoramic camera itself was seven feet long, meaning that's a huge thing, and mm -hmm. we're taking very high, uh, high resolution images of the of the moon. So we needed to cover 
by by the ex, by the chemical in, in instruments and by the geophysical instruments and by the cameras or as, as much of the moon as we possibly can so we needed the time and we actually were very lucky that apollo 15 was the highest orbital mission meaning it went up farther north than any other uh, mission and therefore covered the greatest amount of land lunar surface so it, it worked very nicely we were prepared with the instruments and we covered the largest area on the lunar surface and that's that was really uh, the, the, the cream on the top Farouk's too modest to say this but his training of Al Warden um, resulted in really great observations of the Apollo 17 site and and the data that were collected by the instrument modules in the back were the ones that actually led to us going to Apollo 17. Well, actually, actually, the Apollo 17 site was a place that ob was observed by Al Warden, and he described it. And at the, at that same time, the Apollo program director wa walked down to my place and with uh, my place at the Mission Control Center, in Houston, with the f f flight planners, and he said, "Farouk." It seems your students had picked up a landing site for you. <laughs> he knew that I, I am the secretary of the Lunar Landing Site Selection Committee, and his observations of, of Al Warden have made that site very significant for us. That's, that's incredible. I didn't realize that was how that site got selected. Now, Jim, I, I mean, all these samples that, that folks have been seeing in these images, um, how are we still using those samples to answer questions um, and and spark current research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, you know, not all the samples are opened or analyzed right away, and that's important because with passing time, we increase our capability to make measurements that we're not capable of in the past. That is higher resolution, uh, more rain, etc. So indeed, you may remember that on Apollo 15, um, Dave Scott discovered green glass. And he goes. He, you, you should listen to the transcript. It's absolutely beautiful. And there's green glass. It's green. And it, indeed, it was pyroclastic glass uh, that he discovered. And he sampled it really well and brought it back. And f almost 40 years later, in our labs at Brown, Alberto Sol um, made measurements on that green glass. And with this increased capability, detected significant amounts of water in it. And this revolutionized the thinking. It, oh, my gosh, there is water. That wholly changed our view about the interior. Not only that, it changed our view completely about how the moon originated. Uh, because the moon was thought to be dry, the hypothesis of a Mars-sized object hitting the Earth and the ejector from that going into orbit and collecting for the moon uh, was really accepted. But, but there's water, so it can't be completely dried out by that impact. So that's led to a bunch of other very sophisticated models that are related to that initial hypothesis. Uh, and again, it keeps on giving. So that's why we're now opening some additional samples from Apollo 17. And it's it just keeps on giving as it should. And that's really important because uh, like in a museum, you learn from the past, uh, you know, by reflecting on this, the things that you have. No, it's really incredible. I don't think people realize, you know, when you hear these debates about was going to the moon worth it and what did we learn from going to the moon? I think those of us who were involved just beat our heads against the wall because not only did we learn a lot when we first got the samples back, but but they, you know, as you you often say, that they're always giving. I mean, and we're yeah, always yeah. learning from them. Definitely. And and one of the things that, you know, I, I, Farouk's travel more of the world than I have for sure, but Whenever I go to various places, I get this, did we really go to the moon? You worked at a program? Did we really go to the moon? And I said, you know, it's very simple. NASA is perfectly capable of landing humans on the moon and returning them safely, but they're perfectly incapable of covering it up. And they go, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 I understand. Okay, I got it, right. That's, that's a good point. Um, now, Farouk, when you were director of the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies at, at the National Air and Space Museum, you came up with the idea of exhibiting a piece of a moon rock that visitors could actually touch. And over the years, it remains one of the most popular artifacts at the museum. And I, I really have loved, we, we have a whole montage of, of people touching the rock and you see all kinds of hands people from all over the world. You know, we, as you well know, we, 
we've had over 350 million people visit the National Air and Space Museum, and I bet every one of them has touched that rock. So tell us what inspired you to create this exhibit. I think this is uh, the, my, my most important accomplishment in my career, actually, because I know that uh, I, I was in, in Saudi Arabia and Mecca visiting the uh, Islamic sites, and there is a piece of rock, actually a meteorite, that had fallen from the sky, supposedly to, to at the time of the Prophet Abraham, but pe the people have taken it as a sign from God, and it is a, a very clearly a meteorite, and it is now placed in a corner of the Kaaba and Mecca, and all the Muslims go around it and sometimes look at it, sometimes they touch it, if there are not too many people, and they go around it seven times, and that's part of the pilgrimage. It's you complete the pilgrimage only if you do that around the Kaaba, where you can see this rock that fell from the sky as a sign from God. So I thought, my God, this, this was something for millions of people believe in it, and they, they, if they touch it, they feel so much more than. I said, God damn it, we should make, uh, uh, Mike, Michael Collins was our boss at that time, and he was in the, in the, in the uh, uh, we, we always get together for uh, uh, staff meetings and Monday mornings, and then I, uh, uh, my second Monday morning meeting, I said, Mike, we should really work with NASA to get a piece of the moon rocks that the, Amer the American people touch it, because the American people are the ones that paid for it out of their taxes. We did all of this by taxes collected from American people. They can touch what their money bought for, bought to them. And he said, well, Farouk, you're, you're the journalist. Go get us a piece. If you can get us a piece, we'll, we'll make a great exhibit. So I thought, okay, I will. <laughs> and I started working with the, uh, with the group that actually is, distributes the samples of the moon to all the uh, researchers that apply for with proposals to do some research. And the head of the group was uh, uh, a great geologist that I knew was from the, the chief geologist of the, of, of the state of Washington. And by the name of Jim Adams. And Jim Adams asked me to make my case. And they said, Farouk, you can, can do this. And because you're going to come back and you will tell us that, that it's not broken and we need another piece and we cannot give every department or every museum a piece of rock we can do. I said, but I said, only, there is only one National Air and Space Museum. It is the only one that belongs to the government. And this, and the, the piece, the piece will be protected because there are all kinds of very important items in the airspace museum that are protected. We'll protect that. And I told them that I have been to Mecca and I saw the piece of rock that's a meteorite in Mecca that I, I touched it, and that piece of rock has been touched by millions and millions every single year, and it is protected only by a fierce-looking Bedouin with a sword. Jim, Jim, Jim said, uh, Jim Adams said, uh, uh, Farouk, if you get us a fierce looking bedroom with a sword, we'll give you a piece of moon rock. <laughs> they, they, all, they all laughed and they did allow us to get one because it is the, the only National Air and Space Museum. And yeah, yeah. it's placed there. And uh, every time I see a young kid, nine, seven years old, come around to, talking to his brother and say, I'm going to touch the moon or I'm going to be an astronaut, yeah. or an old woman coming with, with, with helping the walk to, to go up to say that I've been waiting for this all my life. So I think this is, it is really one of my most significant accomplishments to have this piece of moon rock that people can touch. And I would add to that, you know, I, every time I go to the National Air and Space Museum, I take a half an hour just to stand over in a corner and watch people go by. It's amazing. And the teenage kids, sometimes they'll go by, huh, oh yeah. And then you watch them, and then once they, their friends aren't watching them, they sneak back and they touch it. It's just great. <laughs> no, I, I, I've had the same thing, Jim. I think a lot of us sit and watch that, that exhibit because watching people encounter it is absolutely lovely. I urge our NAS members, who are often frequent visitors, to do that. Now, we have a but, ton but of not, questions. But it was, not, it was not right away obvious to the committee of that, at NASA. It took me 18 months to try to convince him to give us a piece. Oh, well, thank you for doing that. Thank you. I mean, the 350 million people, thank yeah, you for really that. <laughs> so, um, all right, we have a ton of questions. So I'm gonna try to get to as many as I can. Plus I didn't get to all mine, so we'll, we'll see how this goes. 
Um, Jim, what did we learn from the photographs of the layering in Hadley Rill? So there was a big debate about this. As Farouk says, uh, that sinuous channel, it's basically like a dried up riverbed. You know, originally people had hypothesized it could have been water. That was before any of the rocks came back. And then it became, is it a lava channel or is it something that's huge amounts of lava came out and it's so turbulent that it actually erodes down in with heat. And so uh, that was one of the big challenges. And so one of the things that we did with this is to, uh, the astronauts made a lot of observations along the margins to look for banks, et cetera, et cetera. And then from the, using the 500 millimeter lens, because they couldn't get to the other side, um, they took pictures across, Dave took pictures across. You can see in the lower left-hand image, he's carrying the, uh, well, there it is right, yeah, lower left-hand image, you can see he's carrying a camera to go over and take those images. And in the next slide, you can see um, the, uh, the layering in the wall. And it was pretty amazing. And so we're learning about the structure combined with the samples, we're piecing the samples back together. And it definitely looks like uh, it was formed by this large volume eruption and turbulent flow, which seems, you know, it's like, a, it's, it's like a surging river of lava, really amazing. And this has taught us a lot about indeed how volcanic eruptions work on the moon. Very cool. Um, I love that real. Okay, Farouk, another question. At your previous lecture at this museum, you made reference that the choice of Descartes as the Apollo 16 landing site was a mistake. Can yes. you elaborate on that? So wow, people really, you should just see, people listen to every word you say. So um, elaborate on that. Yes, indeed. Uh... I worked very closely with the U.S. Geological Survey people that were mapping the moon and helping out all of the people for in the landing site selection. And uh, one of them, the greatest of them, is actually, is the name of Don Wilhelms, who worked out on the stratigraphy of the moon. He established the stratigraphy of the moon based on his discussion, actually, with the stratigraphy of, of, of the Earth, with the talking to Tim Much, who was Jim Head's uh, advisor. And Don Wilhelms believed that all of the things that we see above the earth, above the surface of the earth, that's in, in kind of in clumps, are constructs made at the time, at the site, meaning constructs, meaning something came from below and just constructed. If, if that is true, then it is compositionally very different from the material in other places that are in, in place by impact. So we looked at it. I, and I, I questioned him a lot because I worked with him for years. And I questioned him and would go back and forth and back and forth until I finally was convinced. And therefore, I became the, the, <laughs> the man to post, post push this site to everybody and his mother, to the chemist, to the geochemist, to the people that would do this and that. And then because of these buildings that, that are going to be the constructs, something completely different, and we'll get something that's vastly different from all the lunar material we've had before. And as they and there will be very crystalline material, not chocolate material and stuff. And the astronauts went out and they kept on looking for what we tell them to look for. And they see nothing. And they say, this is Brescia. And this is Brescia. And we say, OK, they'll move to such and such reason. I say, that's Brescia. <laughs> that's Brescia. So we knew that we were absolutely yeah. uh, on the wrong track. And so yeah. I, at the time, I looked at John Williams. I said, my, my God, Don, we must have really messed it up. He said, royally. Yeah. But, that, but again, I just add to that, Ellen, that that's the reason um, that, uh, in fact, we go to these places to decide on these different hypotheses. If we yeah. hadn't done that, we would have been really unsure about all these origin of these light smooth planes. And so the crew was incredibly well trained too, because uh, Johnny and Charlie, when they got out, they immediately recognized that it wasn't volcanic. So we knew from the get go. And so again, we worked at it. And it was really a fascinating thing is that, you know, late at night when the astronauts were on their way back from the moon, uh, we would go into mission control and the flight controllers would let us talk to them, uh, to the astronauts on the way back. and. So we very excitedly got in for the first discussion with, with John and Charlie and, um, and say, you guys did a great job. You guys did a great job. And he said, Johnny with his Georgia twang, well, wouldn't, wouldn't exactly like we expected. He said, you know, you geologists are going to have to go back to the drawing board or wherever it is you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roger that. Right. <laughs> 
but yeah, I, I guess that's super interesting. So it wasn't really a mistake. I would actually, I agree with Jim. I would have reworded that. You had a hypothesis. It turned out to be wrong. But in doing that, we then knew much more about the lunar surface and how to interpret some of the imagery of it. Yeah, in fact, it turned out it turned out to be that it's largely related to ejecta from the big basins, the big impact basins. And that that was big news. That was that revolutionized our thinking. So we yeah. learned a lot. We learned a lot. But it was a mistake in, in, in view of the orbital science because it yeah, limited yeah. the amount that of material that or, yeah. or information that we get to the equatorial region, which is very limited and very small. And we have a lot of information around. We could have gone to the southern highlands and taken a great deal of the chemistry and the geophysics yeah. over the over much larger areas of, of the lunar surface, both on the near side and the far side. Agreed. Jim, can you give us, uh, one of the audience members wants to know if you could give them a feeling of what it was like to be immersed in the science support room during the Apollo 15 EBAs. Well, it was very interesting. I think, you know, uh, one of the things about, that's not very well known about Apollo 15 today is that we landed uh, with 20 meter resolution images, 20 meters, that's like 60 plus feet uh, you know, walk that out and then say, that's the biggest thing we could see before we landed. And so, you know, the question was, we wanted to sample all these boulders. Okay, well, we couldn't tell whether they were there. So radar data, remote sensing radar data, was interpreted to mean that there were lots of boulders along um, the Hadley Delta, one of the mountains of, of the Imbrian Basin. And that's why Dave did a stand-up EVA, because he um, he you know, undid the hatch, stood up and looked around because we, we only had 20 meter resolution and he didn't see any boulders down there. And it wasn't until they got out that they started to talk about exactly as they got closer what they could see. So in the back room, we were madly uh, working on things, revising things, et cetera, uh, thinking about what we would do if there are no boulders uh, and so on. And there was a very much an iterative situation. In fact, uh, you know, when Dave and Jim were on the way down on EVA2 to the uh, to Hadley Delta, which was the big mountain they were going to sample, um, they said, hey, Houston, uh, you know, we're not seeing any boulders. Uh, we need an update on, uh, you know, how much time to spend in which places. And so we worked something out. And uh, Jim Lovell, the Apollo 13 astronaut, was, was in charge of the science group there. He would pass any recommendations up to the Capcom. And... Um, he, so I sat there and we worked it out and I sat there and I said, okay, Jim, here's what you need to tell the Capcom. Okay. And I explained it to him and he kind of glazed over. He's a very smart guy, but a little too much geolingo. And he pulls off his badge, Jim Lovell's badge, NASA badge, hands it to me. He says, take this, go up and tell that to the Capcom. And I went, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. This is the moment of truth here. So I looked around, I grabbed Jack Schmidt, who was, the backup on the backup crew and we went down i flashed the badge to the guard uh, going and i looked up saw jerry griffin the flight director he knew jim lovell had told him i was coming and i looked up at jerry he goes yep and then i went in and sat next to joe allen the capsule communicator and laid it out and he passed it up um and, but you know that that's the way it worked it, you know you had to do it okay let's get it right okay let's get it right uh, lots of real-time replanning in that because of the 20 meter resolution but it was one of the most successful scientific expeditions to the moon. Really unbelievable. Five different objectives, major findings for each one. That's amazing. Farouk, I know you trained the astronauts on what to look for and how to describe the samples, but when the astronauts were actually on the moon for the various missions, where where were you? Were you in mission control? Were you in some back room? Um, where, did they, where did they keep you during the missions? During the missions, I had... Uh only to monitor what would they do from lunar orbit. And that was, I, I, st I stood with the flight planners at the, at the base of the Commission Control Center until starting with Apollo 15, they made visual observations of photography, a formal objective of the Apollo mission from 15, 16 and 17. This was, there is something called visual observations of photography from lunar orbit and I was to be the principal investigator of that. And therefore I had a call, VizOps, they called me, my name would be VizOps. So I had a place in mission control 
to, to, to talk to the Capcom or talk to anybody within the Mission Control Center about what is it that they could not do this scene, they could not look at, at the moon at this time, so what is it that, what else can they do and, and, and so on. So, or they ask questions. So I, I only came to do this formally from uh, in the Mission Control Center on the Apollo 15, 15, 16, and 17. Farouk, I'm, I'm curious as to how you see the roles of geology and geologists, how they've evolved as, as we've gone beyond Apollo. So based on Apollo and then beyond. Very much so, because the, uh, right after Apollo, there was Skylab mission uh, going around the Earth, and then there will be other missions after that with shuttle and all of that. But with Skylab, the man that was responsible for training of the uh, astronauts for Skylab missions was uh, an Apollo astronaut. And he himself called people, and call, including myself, to go down and talk to the Apollo, the Apollo uh, Skylab uh, astronauts to look from, from Earth orbit to look at geological sites, if they can do something, what what else we need photographs of, and what what else we do this and that, and and that continued for the Apollo Soyuz mission, the American Soviet mission. There was the, the NASA actually made it an official function of the astronauts. They called it visual observation of photography, and I became the principal investigator, meaning I headed the team that. Uh, that uh, trained them, trained the astronauts, including f great people that were worked from the Apollo program, including Lee Silver and others, that actually trained the Apollo, the, the Apollo Soyuz astronauts to look at the geology of the Earth and aid to our knowledge from space. So I really think it, it, a great, it helped a great deal in our understanding of our own planet. That's, you know, I've, I've seen that over the years, how it's, how it's really changed myself. Um, Jim, I'm I'm looking forward now, and I'm hoping we can get to a couple more questions that are still out in the chat. But this is my question; I wanted to make sure that we got to. And I'm going to start with Jim, but um, uh, you know, for, feel feel free to to jump in. What do we hope to achieve on new missions to the moon from a, from a scientific point of view? And how did Apollo 15 pave the way for the questions that we're still asking? Yeah, I think the uh, basically Apollo 15, really the first scientific expedition to the moon, which was prepared by the previous missions, of course, but that sets a stage. It was much more complex, incredible objectives, great return, mobility, all the other things that Farouk described. Uh, you know, basically this sets the bar for future exploration. You know, it's been 50 years. We're going back to the moon uh, with Artemis and, uh, and the Chinese are going back with humans, et cetera. Um, so, you know, we we really have to set the bar with this and Apollo 15 did that. So what does that mean? It means that the scientific objectives are critically important and they're being engaged and involved in the current discussions of Artemis as we speak. Um, and the mobility is absolutely required. We need to bring back lots more samples uh, because you can do much more in the laboratory than you can do on the surface. All of these things are really critical. And this is why going to the South Polar region is so important as Artemis is planning to do, uh, because uh, that's outside the Apollo and Luna, the Russian sample return zone. It's outside the Chang'e 5 sample return zone, which tends to be in the northern central part of the moon. And it's actually provides access not only to the polar regions, which might have ice in them, but it also provides access to the far side and maybe even the very ancient, very large South Pole Aiken impact basin. If we can get samples of that, We'll have samples of the interior. We can date those. We can understand the interior. So it, Apollo 15 set the bar, and we should do nothing less after 50 years uh, than that as a baseline. Indeed, and we can still look at uh, also the far side of the moon because the, the lunar crust is much thicker on the far side. It is the composition of the surface material is the same with a very thick crust or not. So we also need to add to that exploration of the far side of the moon, the side of the moon that we do not see. And there's just a couple of a quick points here too, which is that, you know, the moon, really the moon is the witness place for what happened, witness plate for what happened on the earth early on. It's also really the, the baseline, essentially the, the cornerstone for our understanding of the other planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, all the rest of the planets. And so, 
fundamentally, anything we learn about the moon is going to help us understand all the other planets and even exoplanets. And also, of course, about our own history, because the moon came from the Earth and sat witness to events that are long gone on our very active planet. Yeah, one of my favorite questions has always been this this idea of really trying to pin down the heavy bombardment by getting much better age dates for a lot of the large lunar impact craters. For those of you who don't know, that the, the moon went through a very heavy bombardment early in its history, which you can see from all those craters on the surface. But obviously, everything else was undergoing that same heavy bombardment also, Venus, mm -hmm. Earth. Mar the uh, Mars. So we really want to get more age dates to really understand. Um, we know a little bit, we have some shape to that curve of how how the, the bombardment might have fallen off. But that early heavy um, amount of planetesimals, comets, asteroids that were moving around in the inner solar system and, and how that tailed off, everything we date outward on from the earth really depends on that. Now, Jim, we did have a question here on whether you both felt that the South Pole uh, was was the right target. And um, you sort of answered that, but I don't know if either one of you want to expand again on why, you know, the people outside might not know why we're all so fixated on this South Pole Aiken Basin. Well, there, I guess there's, there's a couple of fundamental things here, okay? The first is, um, we, we want to establish a base on the moon, okay? Um, and the only place you can do that really is the South Polar region at the present time. The key is if you're going to be there for more than one lunar day, you have to survive lunar night. The lights go out for two weeks. So you have no solar energy. It's really cold. And that's not easy to survive. So you go to the South Pole, which has essentially permanent solar illumination at a couple of points. So you can actually get energy you can get heat, et cetera. So that's the main reason we're going there. But it's also really critically scientifically because critical scientifically because we have these when 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 ice or eruption occurs on the moon, the gases go to these permanently shadowed regions, these deep craters where the sun never shines and they collect there. So that's a record of solar system ice brought out from the interior, brought in from the outside. And that's gold. It's also a resource. When we go to Antarctica, we try not to, when we helicopter out for fuel work for a couple of months, we, it's too expensive to bring water. So we have to be sure we're near ice deposits because um, we can't carry them with us. Too. The same on the moon. You don't want to carry water from the earth to the moon if it's already there. And maybe you can use that for rocket fuel. So not only is it critically important scientifically, but there's also the opportunity for us maybe to learn how to live off the land, so to speak. And there's a lot of work being done on that right now. Now, we just have time for a couple more questions. I'm going to squeeze a couple more back in. Um, Farouk, you mentioned on um, the far side. Is there anywhere else on um, the moon where you say, if if we had had one more mission, if we'd had 18, that's where I would have gone? Other for the lunar near side uh, highlands, like Tycho. We really wanted to send a mission to the Tycho crater, one of the youngest craters, and one of the, and it, it hit uh, the, har the highland material, nothing else except highland material. And therefore, it will most likely would be something compositionally different and maybe the behavior different due to the impact. So this would be a place to, to, to visit to complete the picture of lunar materials. Jim, anywhere else for you? There are so many places, exciting places to go on the moon. We've discovered mineralogy from orbit, uh, you know, spinels, uh, you know, all kinds of almost gym grade uh, uh, minerals, et cetera. Um, I would say the Aristarchus Plateau, Marius Hills. There's so many really fundamental areas of interest that I think, you know, between the Chinese uh, Taikonauts and the American astronauts and the, you know, international partners that are going to join us in the Artemis Accords, that uh, we've got a lot of things to do. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that, uh, you know, I've been working with the Chinese on their robotic landing sites on the Chang'e 5, Chang'e 4 sites, et cetera. And, um, you know, they're, they're really interested in the science. So I hope together we can actually learn how to conquer lunar night and really explore this place uh, for science. It's like Antarctica. We go to Antarctica. It's a refuge for science, okay? It's not about development. And that's what we need to make the moon, the Antarctica of space. And, and to both of you, um, we all assume and hope there, and this was a question from the audience, that geologists will be going on future Artemis missions. Yes. Yes. And, and, and women geologists. Yes. 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 So what? <laughs> About time. There are 18, 
so there are 18 astronauts um, that um, uh, are in the, Ar the Artemis crew uh, selection. And one of them is a student of mine, Jessica Meir. She's a biologist, but she's passionate about science and geology. And, uh, and there are other geologists involved that are flying right now. And, uh, you know, I think that, that the, the, that's the future. Science is the future, okay? I mean, obviously, it's not like going to um, the Ge Geological Society of American Convention. These are really dangerous missions, okay? You have to be sure that you have a complement of doctors and pilots and things to make the mission successful. But definitely, as we've seen from Dave Scott and Al Warden and Jim Irwin, geological training can turn astronauts uh, into geologists. In fact, when Dave Scott came back, he took me aside the two, two or three days after they got back and said, Jim, it was so much fun doing the geology that I didn't even know I had my suit on. Now, I would have been, I would have been looking over my shoulder to make sure the earth was still there. But yeah. there you go. That that that's that's a spirit. In fact, his wife, uh, Lurton, took me aside one time and he said, "Jim, you you've absolutely spoiled Dave. I had to go to night school to take a course in geology so I could talk to him at dinner." So, <laughs> so that pilots can, as as Farouk has shown with the command module pilots and Al Warden, they can do great stuff. Okay, in science. Well, I want to hugely thank you both for. Um, you know, from my perspective and, and having learned so much from you both, um, it's so impressive to know that, that both of you are the reason to me that Apollo was so successful scientifically because you made sure the right samples got collected, you made sure the right observations got made. And so that's why, again, going back to that question I hear is, did we learn anything about the moon? You said, I would say, you bet we did. And it's in no, yeah small part due to Farouk Elbaz and Jim Head. So um, thank you both incredibly for your contributions um, to science. They are profound. So well, thank, thank you, you for much. joining us here tonight. Thank, thank you, you, you very much, Steve. You're, you're, you're the one that actually says it all. You are the product of our interest. Thanks <laughs> you to you. <laughs> I'd, I'd also say is if Farouk and I are just representing this incredible team, you know, literally, it was a team that did all this. And that's a lesson for everybody. If we can go to the moon, return humans safely in less than a decade, and indeed do three scientific expeditions to the moon in just a short period of time, you know, keep that in mind. We can work together. We can do anything we want to do if we put our minds to it. So it's not just about individuals. It's a team. Absolutely. So thank you very much, Ellen, for all your leadership. Well, thank you, um, you know, to both of our speakers tonight for their continued support of their of our museum and for their involvement. But I especially want to thank the audience um, tonight, not just for your great questions, but for the incredible support that you give to this museum. You're the reason that we're able to inspire that next generation of innovators and explorers. Um, and take all this great knowledge and keep it going and keep the public learning about it. So thank you to our National Air and Space Society members for all that you do for us. Um, and we really look forward to seeing you at the museum as soon as you feel comfortable. Um, please come out to Hazi uh, and, and please come downtown as soon as we open next week. I can't tell you how great it is to see everything again and be in the museum again. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to everybody at the museum who helped make this event happen. Uh, and good night.